man after God's own heart. Our continuing story of the life of David, we are winding down to the end of David's life. But one of the things that I think that we discovered in David's life was he really had a heart for God, didn't he? He loved God with all his heart from the time he was a young boy until he died. And one of the things that he, when he moved as finally became king of Israel and lived in Jerusalem, he, uh, one of the first things that he did was build himself a palace, but he also brought the ark that had been... Uh, been away for so long, he brought it to Jerusalem. And he desired in his heart to build a temple for God. In other words, he lived in this nice palace, but God was still living, so to speak, in a tent in Shiloh, just north of Jerusalem. And so he desired to build a temple for God. But, in turn with me to uh, 2 Samuel 7 verse 5. David had told God that he wanted to build this temple, but and Nathan the prophet said, do what is in your heart for the Lord. But then the, he did said that without talking to the Lord, and the Lord came to Nathan and gave him a message for David. We find this in 2 Samuel 7, chapter 7, starting with verse 5. And this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? God said, I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of the rulers whom I have commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why haven't you built me a house of cedar? God said, I have been traveling from tent in this tent for the last 400 years. And I have never asked that anyone should build me a temple out of cedar, a permanent building. But he also told David that David was not the one to build the temple. He had shed blood. He had, was a warrior. And God said, no, you are not the one to build, but your son will. In verse 12, it says, When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. You know, the book of Revelation tells us that in heaven, or in the new earth, there will be no temple. Why? Because God is with them. Did you get that? God is living with them face to face. There will be no, no curtain between us. We will be in the very presence of God during that time. Isn't that wonderful? They shall be my people and I will be their God. That's what we have to look forward to. And in this promise was not only that Solomon, his son, was going to build the temple, but that one day his son, Jesus, would come and he would establish a temple. And this temple would be his church. Did you know that? Did you know that every one of us are a brick in the temple that is made today for God? It's not this building. The church is you. The temple of God is you. Isn't that what Paul said? That your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? You and I are bricks in this temple today. And who built that? Jesus is the cornerstone. So this promise to David was not only about his son Solomon, but his son Jesus. Well, after over the years... David, from this point on, began to lay plans for the temple. If his son is going to build the temple, that doesn't mean God didn't say that I couldn't put the plans together and bring all the material together. And so David, over the years, he carefully hired the right people to draw the plans, the right architects to draw the plans of his temple to the right specifications. And he began to gather as much as he could, all the materials 
from all over the world. As he put the, as the architects built the, put together the material list, he went all over the world searching for just the right materials for this house that was to be built for God so that his son would not need to go looking for anything. It would all be there, and all he had to do is put it together. In 1 Chronicles chapter 22, we read these words to his son, Solomon. Verse 5 of chapter 22 of 1 Chronicles. Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced, and the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent of fame and glory throughout all lands. And I will therefore make preparation for it. And so David provided materials in great quantity before his death. And then verse 6, he called for Solomon his son and charged him to build a house for the Lord and the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, my son, I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name because you have shed so much blood before me on the earth. Behold, a son shall be born to you, you who shall be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all his surrounding enemies. For his name shall be Solomon, and I will give him peace and quiet to Israel in his days. And he shall build a house in my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish his royal throne in Israel forever. And then verse 14, it says, With great pains I have provided for the house of the Lord 100,000 talents of gold and a million talents of silver and bronze and iron beyond weighing for there is so much of it timber and stone too I, you know I did some research on that 3,000 100,000 talents of gold is 3,750 tons of gold At today's rate, cha-ching, that's $144 billion. And 37,000 tons of silver, which is minuscule because it's, I think it's only $12 or $13 an ounce. But $144 billion. He had gathered together in gold, silver, bronze, stone, everything. And he says to verse 19, Now set your mind and heart, Solomon, to seek the Lord your God and arise. Build the sanctuary of the Lord God. And David in chapter 29 of First Chronicles gives an offering appeal similar to maybe uh, Denny's offering appeal today. Okay? Stole a little bit of what I'm going to reiterate this. An offering appeal. It says in, verse, in chapter 29, if you'll turn with me there, before his death, he called all the people and the rulers together and he shared how his son was still young and, and inexperienced and needed their help. He told them that he had gathered, as I read, this large quantity of materials for the building of the temple. And he says in verse 3, Besides, in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give of my personal treasures of gold and silver. Not only had he gathered all of this, going out and gathering all this this gold and silver to, to build the temple over his lifetime, but now he gives from his personal treasuries, his, his own bank account. And he gives 3,000 talents of gold and 7,000 talents of silver. That's 110 tons of gold. 
from his own personal bank account. 110 tons of gold is about $4 billion. Okay, today. And he also gave 20, 260 tons of silver on top of that. And these were to be used for the overlaying of the walls of the building for the gold work and the silver work and for all the work to be done by the craftsmen. Now, who is willing? Now his appeal is to the people. Now, who is willing to consecrate himself today to the Lord? Then the leaders of the families. In other words, he's saying, who's going to match my funds? Not only was David a man after our God's own heart, but he was a man with a generous heart. He opened up his bank account and wrote a check for $4 billion for for the Lord. A generous heart. And then he appeals to everybody, now match me. Did they? Well, the Bible says in verse 3, continuing on, the leaders of the families, the officers of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and the commanders of hundreds, the officials in charge of the king's work, It says, gave willingly. Willingly. Why? God loves a cheerful giver. You know, I wish I had a heart like my wife. She has a generous heart. Every time she passes someone on the road that's in need, On the corner there with a sign, she's a softie. She's always pulling out her purse and pulling out something for them. I wish I had that. I'm a little more skeptical. I don't have that generous heart. I hope to, maybe. David gives of himself, and then he asks others, and they gave willingly. In fact, the Bible tells us that the offering collected that day summed up to 190 tons of gold and some change. And 375 tons of silver. Then he asked those who gathered, now who is willing to consecrate himself to the Lord today? In verse 6, he says, they gave willingly and they gave with their whole heart. They offered it freely to God. I like that, don't you? They gave with their whole heart. The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, and they also gave freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. What a day that was. In fact, I'd like to read to you out of Patriarchs and Prophets this, what she says about this day. Now David's heart was glad in God. As the chief of the fathers and the priests, princes of Israel, so nobly responded to his appeal and offered themselves to the important work before them. And as they gave their service, they were disposed to do more. I didn't give enough. And they swelled the offerings, giving of their own possessions into the treasury. And David had felt deeply of his own unworthiness in gathering the materials for the house of God. And the expression of the loyalty and the ready response of the nobles of his kingdom, as with willing hearts they dedicated their treasures to Jehovah and devoted themselves to his service, filled him with joy. But it was God alone. It was God alone who imparted this disposition to his people. Folks, we don't have normally a a generous heart. We have a self-centered heart. We give oftentimes begrudgingly, but it is God who gives us a heart to be generous. 
He, not man, must be glorified. It was he who on that day provided the willingness to bring their precious things for the temple. It was all of the Lord. If his love had not moved upon the hearts of the people, the king's efforts would have been in vain. And the temple would never have been built. All that man receives, my friends, listen to this. If you if you have not heard anything else, listen to this. All that man receives of God's bounty still belongs to God. You thought that 90% that you had in your pocket after you've given your tithe is yours? Uh-uh. Nope. It's not. You have nothing. God owns everything, including you. Whatever God has bestowed in the valuable and beautiful things of the earth is placed in the hands of men to test them, to sound the depths of their love for him and their appreciation of his favors. Whether it be the treasures of wealth or of intellect, they are to be laid a willing offering at the feet of Jesus the giver saying, meanwhile, with David, all things come from thee, and of thine own have we given thee. I like that. David, at the end, prays in verses 14. David says to God, but who am I? And what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. For we are strangers before you, and sojourners, as all our fathers were. Our days on earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. Everything is temporary. Our Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for the building of your house, for your holy name, comes from your hand and all, is all your own. It's yours. Well, Solomon took those materials, and of course we know that he built the temple. One of the great and fantastic wonders of the ancient world. It was magnificent. I wish we had some pictures. My friends, I want to share with you as we should remember God is a generous God. Do you believe that? God is a very generous God. Last January, we were looking at another year as a church of deficits. Just a year ago. Not only in the church, but in the school. It looked bleak. But as a church, we came together and sought the help of the Lord. You remember that? How many were able to go to that meeting? If you didn't, you missed out because that's when the direction of God changed. We learn that God does not have a money problem, right? If God owns everything, he doesn't have a money problem. So should his people? Now, I'm not preaching prosperity gospel here. I just want you to listen, hear me out. God does not have a money problem. We are needed to learn to be willingly follow his plan when it comes to what he gives us and be good stewards of those resources he gives us. Right? Sometimes things were spent. I have made some investments, so to speak, or some spending mistakes in my life. Anybody else? Right? Okay. God is always ready and willing to help you if you learn your lessons. And you know, one of the lessons is buying things on credit. It steals from the Lord's treasury because you think about it, all of that, God is paying interest. 
He owns it. Why is he paying interest? And I think interest robs the church in his cause. Now, I have been paying, and that's why Ellen White says we should avoid it like the plague. And I tried to teach my kids, stay away from credit. Because I know this, I'm still paying today. After 30 years, I'm still paying credit. And it's robbed God. God has a different plan, though. With the Lord's help, last year, and your willingness to be generous with what God has given you. We saw his hand at work among us, didn't we? God gave us a surplus for the year and paid off our school debt to the conference. Amen? Amen. Rejoice. And the more we give, my friends, the more we receive. Even with our church funds, it is important for us to remember to be generous. You know, we had our wonderful Apple Festival, and we had also a little container. I think, where's John? John made a container uh, for donations. And we said, you know what? We, the school, we have been so blessed. Heidi, I talked about it. Let's, let's put a donation box out, not for the school, but for some other ministry. And so it was decided that we would take the donations that came in that day and give it to our community service and our food bank. Why? Because we're all in it together. When God blesses one of us, we can share with someone else, even in the church. Amen? So I bring this up again so that we never forget what God has done by channeling his funds through us, his people. God's plan is simple. 10% is his. We give it back. Well, everything is his. And the offerings is, comes from the heart. A willing heart. A heart cheerfully gives for what God has given to us as God blesses us. Has God blessed you? The Bible says his plan is this. Ever since the time of your fathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says God. But you ask me, well, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you ask, how do we rob you, Lord? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour you out so much a blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I had a church member in Wilmington, Delaware, that I used to go. Uh, he had uh, means, and he seemed God had blessed him with, with funds that he could give. And so I used to go to him when we had uh, different projects, if we needed some help in. And you know what he would always tell me? It's the Lord's money anyway. Sure, I'll help. It's his money. I wish I had said that all the time, but I don't always. Remember Jesus and his disciples in the temple? And they were watching as people were bringing in their money. And Jesus noticed in the shadows a little uh, woman who was a widow came in and dropped her two little mites in the offering uh, box and snuck off. Jesus wasn't going to let that happen, was he? What did he say? He said she gave more than the rest because she gave her all. I'll give my two mites, said a prosperous business owner, to one who asked for contribution for a charitable cause. Do you mean the widow's mite? The other asked. Certainly, said the business owner. I will be satisfied with half that much, the man said. Just how much are you worth? Oh, the business owner said, about a million dollars. 
The man smiled and said to the business owner, then write a check for 500,000. That will be half as much as the widow gave, for she gave all she had and all of her living. My friends, this is God's plan. Based on percentage, 10% for tithe and another percentage for offerings, so that everyone will give according to how God is blessed. If you set your offerings as well on a percent, God can channel funds through you to fund his work here at Riverside and around the world. You see, tithe is used to support the pastor, teachers, and missionaries, and those who work for the church. The offerings are what are stay here at the local church and, it, and supports its ministries here. We call it church budget. But you say, Pastor, I can't give very much. I can't give like David. I don't have billions of dollars. Well, somebody had enough to pay off the debts to all the schools. And I don't even know who they were, but I do know this. It didn't come from them. It came from God. They just had a generous heart to be able to use it. But you say, I, don't, I can't give that much. I'm going to tell you right now. It's not about dollars and cents. It's not about money. The question is, it's about your heart. Does Jesus have your heart? Because if he does, then you will be like the widow and have a grateful and generous heart. A man of great means gave weekly a sizable sum of money to his church. A poor widow was a member of the same church. She worked hard to support herself and her four children alone. Her income was small. She had also gave regularly out of her little earnings to the church. One day the man said to the pastor, this poor widow ought not to give anything to the church. What she gives represents a great sacrifice. I will increase my weekly giving, adding the amount the widow has been giving every Sabbath. So the minister went to the widow and told her this, that the wealthy member would cover what she has been giving and she would not have to give. Tears came to her eyes. And she said, does he want to take away from me the comfort I experience in giving to the Lord's work? Think how much I owe Jesus. My health is good. My children keep well. I received so many blessings that I feel I couldn't live if I did not give my offerings to Jesus every week. My friends, see, it's not about money. It's about heart. And God is looking for hearts that are like his. And he will give you funds. He will give you blessings. Not only funds, but to give you talents and gifts. He will bless you with blessings. Because why? Because he is testing your heart to see if it is generous. Because he emptied heaven for you and me when he gave us his son. He bankrupt heaven. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 18, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. My friends, the most valuable thing in this world is people. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God paid for people. That's what's valuable. And when we have souls that we see up in the kingdom that we have prayed for, that we have worked for, that we have given for, that's the true reward. People. David said these words as was so eloquent, we read by uh, Torsten. Good will come to him who is generous and lends freely. Did you hear that? Good will come to him who is generous and lends freely, who conducts his affairs with justice. Surely he will never be shaken. A righteous man will be remembered forever. He will have no fear of bad news. His heart will be steadfast, trusting in the Lord. 
His heart is secure. He will have no fear. In the end, he still look, he will look in triumph on his foes. My friends, you want security in this life? You want peace? God, let God give you a generous heart. That's what I want. I want to be generous. For God has blessed us as a church so much. Never forget, never forget what he has done for you every day. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for the blessings that have just poured out upon us. That every day we see miracles, but we don't always notice them. Oh, Lord, I pray that you will help us to see them and be grateful for whatever you give. For we know that our, our well-being is in your hands. And so, Lord, help us not to focus on our needs, but help us to focus on on our blessings. Oh Lord, I pray that you will help us each to have the generous heart, the loving heart that, that David had. And may we be have the heart after your own heart. Lord, bless us as a church. Continue and help us never to forget what already you've done. Praise be to you for you own everything. And Lord, one day, we will be able to see you and take those we've worked for and given for home with you. We thank you in Jesus' name.